the IMF money come from historically? Where does IMF get its funding? It's from the historical exploitation of the global South. European countries at the time, European empires, um, then, then the US followed, have all historically gathered their wealth, the gold. There is not, if you go to the United Kingdom, there is not a gold mine in the soils of the United Kingdom. There exists no gold on the level it does in the global South and Africa. And the IMF uh, director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. He said on many occasions, which I find so funny that they're saying if we allow for China to renegotiate on its own terms, that could uproot our traditional um, negotiating format. And that's precisely what needs to actually happen. The media asked me before, like, um, is China trying to lead an alternative project? And they say it in that negative tone. And I'm like, I would be super thrilled if China is leading an alternative regional project, an alternative economic project. We were not relying on the US dollar. We're not waiting for China to lead us to, to you know, some utopian world, but we understand that materially and within the specific conjuncture, the rise of China and the different regional and political vehicles and economic um, opportunities it has provided has enabled us to make different choices and actually have choices. In the past May, several African leaders visited China, including the president of Eritrea, the president of Democratic Republic of Congo, and also the foreign minister of Zimbabwe. But interesting enough, also in May, several Western mainstream media published several articles undermining China's relationship with other developing nations. Once again, they were targeting the projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. Once again, they peddled the debt trap diplomacy narrative, which has already been debunked by even scholars from Western universities. So to better understand the relationship between China and Africa, in this episode, I invited a researcher from Africa. Her name is Michaela Arscock. She's a researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, the editor with the Dongxing News, and also the host for the Korean and Africa and China podcast. Mika, welcome back to the show. Sure, thank you so much for having me. I work both in Dongsheng, which is an international group of researchers who are interested in what is happening in China, but not mediated through Western media and Western research institutes mm -hmm. and knowledge bases, epistemologies, etc. But how do we understand China on its own terms? How do I understand China in relation to global South interests, which are very different from US interests? So um, part of that work is I work on a podcast with Amadeus Musumali, my co-host called The Crane and Africa China Podcast, where we basically try to interview people and get into discussions around issues that relate to China, Africa, um, how do we understand it? What are some of the pressing topics? How is it misrepresented or misunderstood? What lies, you know, at the heart of the situation? So that we can basically advance not only um, African people's, you know, developmental, sovereign developmental interests, but also so we can have more meaningful, you know, South-South cooperation and South-South engagement. Mm -hmm. That's why we need your analysis, your expertise. Like we've seen, the um, huge amount of attacks from Western media targeting China-Africa cooperations, all these uh, Belt and Road Initiative related projects in different African countries. But like, recently, we, we saw this wave coming back again. Uh, it's very interesting timing um, because these are articles coming from rioters and uh, Associated Press and several other media all releasing articles basically saying China is debt trapping African countries again. If I may, <laughs> I want to read a few paragraphs of that article uh, to our viewers. If you haven't r read that article, it's from Associated Press published on May 19th. The headline is China's loans pushing world's poorest countries to brink of collapse. What a headline. So why it says that? It says, a dozen poor countries are facing economic instabilities and even collapse under the weight of hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign loans, much of them from the world's biggest 
and most unforgiving government lender, China. And Associated Press analysis, dozens of countries most indebted to China, including Pakistan, Kenya, Zambia, and Laos, and Inner Mongolia, and found paying back that debt is consuming an even greater amount of the tax revenue needed to keep schools open, provide electricity, and pay for food and fuel. And it's draining foreign currency reserves this country used to pay interest on the, those loans, leaving some of it just a month before the money is gone. And the next paragraph says, behind the scenes, is China's reluctance to forgive debt and its extreme secrecy about how much money it has loaned and on what terms, which has kept other major lenders from stepping in to help. On top of that is the recent discovery that borrowers have been required to push cash in hidden escrow accounts that push China to the front of the line of creditors to be paid. So, and it goes on to analyze the situation in Pakistan, in Kenya, Sri Lanka, and a lot of these countries. I mean, I want to ask you, is there any truth in this article? There are factual elements, but there's not truth in the sense of what is it telling us about the tendency and characteristics of IMF lending, of, um, you know, euro bonds, of Chinese lenders, they are conflating and again, you know, statistics, we can throw statistics in any kind of fashion to serve any narrative. And so it's the usual thing of you can take certain statistics, but if you're not putting it in context, it's actually not telling us anything about the truth or, 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 or what's happening in the country. And so, for example, I think right now it's strategic for the West to basically say that China's not wanting to play ball, but to say that it's because China's greedy or, you know, the various ways it's being framed. But in fact, we are in this particular historic conjuncture when there is an opportunity, we're seeing cracks in the Western hegemonic financial system where it doesn't make sense for China to go all in and reproduce the same kind of predatory um, economic system that relies on, you know, the exploitation of the global south at the benefit of the global north, essentially. We can also talk about the blatant misinformation and like incorrect framing of a lot of things. You know, the big line always starts like China is the biggest, you know, world's biggest um, and most unforgiving uh, government lender, which is inaccurate or or misposition for a couple of reasons. Let's start off with this question of, you know, the biggest. So China is normally presented as the biggest. China is the continent's biggest bilateral creditor in terms of, you know, from a state to other states. It is one of the biggest. But most of Africa's public debt is largely held by private Western creditors. So I think there was a study that came out last year, and surprisingly, it was a joint study by Columbia University and the University of Oxford, who are not necessarily what we'd say are going to write anything favorable, um, but nonetheless are committed to writing factual things. And so in their study that they released last year, they basically indicate how um, China accounts for 18 percent of Africa's public debt. And within that, that 18 percent is within the one third owed to bilateral. So of a third that's owed to bilateral lenders, China does make up a majority, but in terms of the proportion of other lenders, one third is international financial institutions, the other third is um, euro bonds, right? So the bulk, 60%, over 60% of um, debt owed, public debt owed in the African continent is largely to Western lenders. But, and then the one minor point I'll make is this question of unforgiving is also a bit strange because one is the the form of Chinese um, loans has a different logic to it than traditional or the traditional forms of the Western um, modes, where one, it's based on a concept of like patient, you know, capital, where it's this understanding that the investment is not going to reap immediate benefits. So it's going to take a longer process of time. And because of that, it means that there have been lower interest rates, there have been longer periods of repayment, there's often been restructuring. Um, and a big point that is very different from a lot of the 60% debts owed to the Western 
um, international fin financial institutions is a lack of conditionalities attached to the loans. Even the model of development or um, um, foreign aid and foreign loans from China has a different logic to it that's not premised on you have to restructure your economies in order to um, receive that and basically put the burden on African countries to follow a Western model that has historically benefited the elite at the behest of the majority. So I don't think the concept of this unforgiving, austere Chinese government is fair, especially given the fact that and that particular article talks about how China was in a, in a they presented it as a negative thing, that China doesn't want to sit along with other multilateral lenders to agree to similar negotiations. And I think it's because China knows that if it goes and sits with the historical um, country or the countries who've consistently led these processes, it's going to be on the back seat. It's going to end up having to pay disproportionately for what is actually a responsibility that should be on Western um, instant international institutions. You know, in the environmental world, in the UN, this idea about common but differentiated responsibility came up in the um, late in the early 90s. And I think that's an idea that should apply to loans and financing is that we do have a common response, co um, common interest, we should have differentiated responsibilities. And so the IMF and what's her name, Kristen, Kristaleva, I, I forget her name, uh, Christina, oh, the IMF uh, director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. She said on many occasions, which I find so funny that they're saying if we allow for China to renegotiate on its own terms, that could uproot our traditional um, negotiating format. And that's precisely what needs to actually happen. One thing that always interests me in these moments is they're basically talking about how it's unfair on the IMF that China is not, you know, playing ball. And it's because, again, China doesn't want to have to bear the historic responsibility that actually is owed or on the shoulders of those Western lenders. Where does the IMF money come from historically? Where does IMF get its funding? It's from the historical exploitation of the global South. European countries at the time, European empires, um, then, then the US followed, have all historically gathered their wealth, the gold. There is not, if you go to the United Kingdom, there is not a gold mine in the soils of the United Kingdom. There exists no gold on the level it does in the global South and Africa in particular. And so through this historical exploitation, they get to a point where, well, they have enough excess that they can put it back into a so-called international governmental body that actually still is serving the interests of the, of the historical empires. We can't talk about the character of Chinese lending without understanding the character of Western lending and the historical processes that brought a lot of African countries to have to um, negotiate with China and have to find alternatives. And the interesting part is China's recent development to gain the, this type of financing, its economic rise in the last few decades, hasn't come from a historical colonization of the rest of the world uh, and you know total domination of the rest of, of the world. So of course, China also has to be smart about where it's putting its financing, how it's going to recover, what are some of the benefits. We're not saying this is all altruism um, out of some kind of good nature, but it's about how do we advance a common project that has slightly different rules. And the IMF is, and a lot of the Western international bodies are freaking out about the fact that China is setting new rules and a lot of the global South is finding quite attractive. The, the new process. Well, there's some new rules. They're probably yeah. <laughs> and actually, in um at Tricontinental, we have this study that we launched last month called "Life or Debt: The Stranglehold of Neocolonialism and Africa's Search for Alternatives," where we the stuff I've been talking about. We kind of look at what has actually created the permanent debt crisis. It's not the fact that we're also historically told it's not about the corruption of individual countries. Uh, and our individual elites, it's a historical process that you have to understand colonialism and imperialism and the financial institutions that serve those interests before you can really understand um, why we are sitting in a debt crisis. And then two is that we have seen new vehicles 
um, in the global south emerge new political vehicles, whether it's BRICS, whether it's the in Africa, the New Development Bank, whether it's, um, I mean, that was also for BRICS is the New Development Bank, whether it's some of these global south initiatives that are coming up, whether it's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is called the SCO, um, and the developments we've seen in um, Western Asia and North Africa in cooperation with China, new vehicles are emerging that might offer alternative forms of financing and development that aren't premised on the kind of neoliberal ideals and logic. Doesn't mean they're perfect, doesn't mean there's not a lot of work that needs to be done, particularly the so-called weaker countries. But I think that um, China's model of development itself is already something that we need to take seriously. Why I'm saying the timing is quite interesting because all the articles came out in May and what happened in May, several African leaders visited China. For example, in the past few weeks, we have President of Eritrea visited China, President of DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, visited China, Foreign Minister of Zimbabwe also visited China. So all these uh, officials from these African countries are seeking to upgrade, seeking closer ties with China. And actually DRC upgraded, China and DRC upgraded their relationship to comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. So it's not, it's not a coincidence when you combine this media attack from West, uh, from Western mainstream media and uh, what's happening diplomatically between China and Africa, it mean, it's designed. Uh, so I'm when, uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Do you see this, is new, this new wave of attack is especially targeting to undermine the China-Africa relations, undermine BRI projects? Sure, um, I think that is definitely the case. And I think one is we need to as you said, um, I don't think it's a coincidence. For example, before the DRC uh, president came in May, we also saw in specifically French foreign press and associated press, we saw a huge um, news cycle, an upswing in the news cycle around um, so-called you know, illegal mining and poor mining practices. We also saw it around the debt crisis. But of course, most of these things don't A, seem to be coming from a grounded contextual reality of what's happening in the African continent. Um, and they also don't seem to be proposing what alternative you know, relationships and processes should be in place. I still, to this day, can't believe how little fanfare uh, China received in Africa when in end of 2020, early 2021, it was announced that um, China eradicated uh, extreme poverty. That's something that should have been of you know, high importance to the global South and in Africa in particular. But unfortunately, because of the different historical tools of communication we've inherited that largely are funded and created by the West, and if not entirely funded or created by the West, still employ a Western logic that turns to the West, uh, we've not been able to develop more independent platforms to have these communications. The only recent event actually I participated in in China in Shanghai was in 4th, 5th May. There was a conference on international communications of the global south. And it was, I think, probably the first time that we've seen global south media come together on an independent platform that isn't mediated by the West or actually necessarily entirely China-led, even though they were Chinese sponsors, but that it had a variety of people who wanted to offer anti-imperialist forms of dialogue, um, common interest forms of dialogue that aren't state to state per se. You know, These are different independent media groups as well. So I think that the Global South and Africa in particular are interested in alternatives, but we are hampered by the onslaught of Western media, which just for the audiences to know, in Africa, a lot of the main channels of communication, even there's a big platform called um, Africa News. It's largely 
funded by French media and largely recycles stories from French media and through the syndication of French produced media that has a certain interest, political interest, economic interest. Um, in South Africa and in many Southern African countries, the national NED, the National um, Economic Endowment, Endowment for Democracy. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, in, the National Endowment for Democracy, not economic. The National they, Endowment for they Democracy. They are everywhere. <laughs> NED are everywhere, and uh, in, in, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, that's how they created all these troubles for China. But yeah, I'm sure they're there too, but go, go on, and, continue your, your story. And historically, the NED, so let's, they, it, was, it was founded in like in the 1980s, and at the time, it was channeling huge amounts of money into, for example, where I'm largely based most of the time in South Africa, were channeling them into some of the big um, periodicals, the big presses, uh, basically trying to push what they would call democratic awareness, but it was actually anti-communist, anti-Marxist discourse. And that same group organization that was pushing that and was collaborating at a time when the rest of the world was trying to boycott apartheid, they were collaborating um, with the apartheid uh, regime. They continue to exist today. So the Competes Act, which came out in 2022, which basically funds 500 million to a so-called global uh, media agency. A few months after that, there's a story circulating in Zimbabwe about how the U.S. Embassy had sponsored a workshop for Zimbabwean journalists to do independent investigations. But essentially, the content of that is that they were targeting um, Chinese companies, or they were told to target Chinese companies, to look for malpractices in Chinese companies. Again, not saying that they aren't Chinese private companies who are pursuing the profit, you know, the bottom line, so might do those things in the same way that there are multiple thousands of European, hundreds and thousands of European and US companies, because we exist in conditions not of our own making. We live in a capitalist world, so people have commercial interests and there's certain negative aspects that come, not aspects, negative things that always will manifest from certain business practices. But basically this US embassy is funding Zimbabwean journalists to target Chinese companies. And when I went and looked at the funding of the, it was called like the, it was a trust, I forget the full name, but it was the like um, trust for democratic something which is supposedly a local um, civil society organization in Zimbabwe. And when you go and look at the NED grants, the grants historically have been coming, were created and were coming from the NED. So mm -hmm. it's not surprising then that there is this wave in not only Western media, but also in African media, where there'll be hostility towards um, Chinese, um, the Chinese presence in Africa and Chinese uh, engagement with the African continent, African people, is because we still inherit and continue to have a legacy and continued practice of Western funding of a lot of the media projects that serve certain interests, certainly not those mm -hmm. of the African people. I think many people, either from the West or from within Africa, they say China is the next, it's a Trojan horse. Uh, they come as a friend now, but actually they will uh, they will be the next United States. They will be the next colonizer. Mm -hmm. I posted a clip of my interview with Akende, the director of Pan Africa today. And she said, uh, the Vice President of the United States arrived in the Chinese built airport, a drive on a road built by China, and uh, speak in the venue that is China's gift to Zambia and uh, to curb Africa's uh, to co cooperation with China. But then there's uh, many comments. They try to undermine this cooperation. You see the, how they are being uh, China's investment or BRI projects are being villainized by the people even within Africa. So I'm wondering, what's your thought? What's the, in your opinion, in your analysis, what's the difference between China's cooperation with uh, Africa and uh, Western countries' cooperation with Africa? Uh, so, I mean, that actual, that article where I was talking about a Trojan horse, I think that it was in the Council for Foreign Relations, which is, you know, a mouthpiece of Washington and its imperialist aims and designs, to put it lightly. And it said, 
Trojan horse of regional development and military expansion. And I thought that was actually really interesting for two reasons. And I'll start with the military aspect is one, there's always cyclically something about China and the military. But if you look at the numbers and figures, China has a very minor foreign military presence in comparison to the exist the actual military expansionists. I mean, one is that, and I've spoken about this with you and others many times, the big foreign military presences in the continent is number one, the United States of America, which, you know, the recent um, CIPRI, you know, the Stockholm Institute for, they research militarism, et cetera. They, they released the 2022 military uh, budgetary spending and it's now 2.2 trillion in uh, military spending. And who has almost half that budget? It's the US at 877 trillion. And if you put the US plus their allies who I would uh, organize as Europe and Japan, the historical triad that after World War World War II, um, their budget together is like 1.46. So they have, you know, almost 66 something percent of military spending. And China in comparison has 200 and something billion compared to the 877. So just proportionally. And of course, China is a much bigger country that has, you know, bigger security needs just by proportion alone. So that's one. Two is that um, the actual military expansionism is not part of China's historical approach. China always keeps within its borders and re retains a defensive approach, not the offensive that we've seen historically with the US. I mean, you know, the G7 met um, the other day in Hiroshima. And I don't know if many people know that the premise of the G7 is in this historical US subordination of Japan and Europe after World War II. And after the subordination of Japan and Europe through NATO, which was established, the North Atlantic Treaty was established in 1949. And then in 1951, there was the US-Japan uh, Security Treaty, which basically allowed the US to retain and expand military bases in Europe, specifically in Germany and in Japan. So the US has historically always pushed to have a strong military presence in order to secure its you know, economic and political interests. So that is a vastly different approach if we're just talking about so-called expansion. And the US continues to expand as we've seen since 2004 with the, the expansion of NATO, since in the last uh, decade when we have heard of global NATO, which essentially is the US led global NATO. So the expansionism is largely coming from the US and its subordinates in terms of its allies in Europe and Japan um, and its lesser allies in South Korea, et cetera, which is completely different to China who has always used its military for defensive purposes. And the one um, so-called base it has in Africa and Djibouti was largely created as a joint exercise for the UN's peacekeeping mission around piracy. And they're trying to decrease piracy in the Horn of Africa. So it was a UN, you know, initiated initiative. It's not just out of their own, you know, um, aims. Then two is the Trojan horse, they said in terms of regional development. And I, I think that's really funny because some of us are like, yes, we would like an alternative regional development project. We don't want to have the Western, you know, international organization of things. We want a new regional development. We want to, and we've seen this, as I said, through through BRICS, through, I mean, in Latin America has a lot of strong regional development projects in CELAC and different, you know, Caribbean Latin America um, projects. But right now, regionalism grounded in, and, and held in the global South based on our interests is ultimately what we should be pushing for. Not so we can continue to have the so-called, you know, the rules-based international order, which is just a code for U.S., you know, hegemonic interest-based world order, not a consensus-based world order where it's based on a common interest, consensus building, uh, collectivity, and and people centric centricism. Is that a word? Centering the people. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
it's kind of for me it's strange when and and a lot of chinese media have asked me before like um is china trying to lead an alternative project and they say it in that negative tone and i'm like i would be super thrilled if china is leading an alternative regional project an alternative <laughs> economic project we were not relying on the us dollar i mean you know in that article the first one you spoke of they're talking about how um paying back debt is a huge issue because of foreign currency but the foreign currency that they're not wanting to name is the dollar and if we hmm. had a different world system where the dollar did not dominate then you wouldn't have to worry about securing your foreign currency reserve in in the same way that you do now so um again this is to say that a lot of us in the global south we're not waiting for china to lead us to to you know some utopian world but we understand that materially and within the specific conjuncture the rise of china and the different regional and political vehicles and economic um opportunities it has provided has enabled us to make different choices and actually have choices in the past and in, in the 90s and the 80s and before that we didn't have a choice as a uh, former colonized nations because we largely had still um relinquished our sovereignty to the dominant financial western institutions and so china gives us alternatives that uh the us led projects and european projects do not and then the second thing that i want to see more of is we need more people to people exchange because i won't lie to you jing jing like we still have um because of the endemic poverty on the african continent it's always easier to blame the foreigner in south africa it's rampant with xenophobia against other african nationals um but it's because of the endemic poverty and so it's up to us we need to within our countries push for the advancement of our people so that we can better come to the stage of collectively bargaining for our our common interests um yeah but <laughs> i guess that's some of the things that come to mind yeah thank you so much mika uh it's always great to hear your analysis i'm sure there will be a lot of other topics that we can continue to talk about because uh, united states and other western countries is, is so jealous over the closer relationship between china and africa they will continue to unleash their attacks uh so uh, we we'll, i will we'll see more see you more on this show and i hope that next time we probably can do this in person in beijing again <laughs>